Hello and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership and organized in collaboration with the Global Green Growth Institute. I'm Ben Simmons and serve as the head of the GDKP Secretariat. We're very happy to have you with us today and of course hope you are all safe and healthy. Uh, this is the fifth webinar in our series on sustainability after COVID-19. We are extremely fortunate to be joined by a high-level panel of global experts today who will explore the implications the pandemic is having on gender equality and opportunities for promoting women's empowerment through the recovery efforts. During the webinar, please feel free to make comments through the questions box. It's a great opportunity to engage directly with the experts. A full recording of the webinar will be available on our website at ggkp.org. After the webinar, we would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete our short survey. The feedback we receive helps us shape our future webinars. Our next webinar in this series will take place next week at the same time, and we'll explore the relationship between COVID-19 and nature, considering opportunities for investing in biodiversity and ecosystems to support long-term economic recovery from the pandemic. If you are not familiar with the GGKP, I encourage you to visit our web platforms and join the growing community at ggkp.org forward slash subscribe. This is the best way to stay up to date on the latest studies and insights related to COVID-19 and green growth. It is now my great honor to introduce the moderator for today's event, Frank Reisberman, the Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute. Frank has held numerous leadership roles throughout his career, serving as the CEO of the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, a director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a director at Google.org, uh, Google's philanthropic arm, and is director general of the International Water Management Institute. Frank, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to today's webinar and hereby turn the webinar over to you. Thank you, Ben, for that generous introduction. Uh, yes, I'm uh, speaking to you this evening primarily as the Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute. That means I'm speaking to you from Seoul, where it is uh, rather later than in Europe, uh, the location where Ben spoke from. For me, it's 10 at night and we're welcoming people from all around the world in this new mode that we're all getting used to uh, during this uh, pandemic crisis that we have now uh, all lived through for several months and indeed I think we're still only at the beginning. So this evening we have a chance to explore in more detail what this pandemic uh, means, not only the pandemic of course but particularly also the economic crisis that is a consequence of efforts to flatten the curve and we're indeed joined by uh, a panel of experts that uh, brings a uh, a very, I believe, interesting set of perspectives and views uh, to this particular subject. Let me introduce the panelists briefly uh, before turning it over to our first speaker. The intent is that each of the four speakers will give an opening statement, and after that, I will direct a number of questions to the panel. And of course, uh, we will also try to. Uh, pass the questions that the audience shows in the chat, chat box to the panel. Now, if the discussion becomes very lively, I may not be able to summarize all of the questions in the chat box, but I'll do my best. All right, so to begin with uh, the first panelist this evening and also the order in which we'll uh, give them the floor or the, the camera, the first is Bridget Burns. Uh, a feminist, environmental activist, and also director of Women's Environment and Development Organization, known as We Do, uh, known We Do for many years and very active organization. Uh, and Bridget specializes in policy and advocacy, research and movement building at the intersection of gender equality, women's rights, environment, and climate justice. She has done this for uh, a number of years, particularly focused on integrating gender equality into decisions and outcomes of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So Bridget will be uh, first, but let me also introduce the other panelists. After Bridget, we'll have Sonia, Sonia Diaz, uh, and she calls herself a garbologist. And if you don't know what that is, that would also be, uh, well, she'll explain that I'm sure in more detail, but that would be a waste specialist. And she works at WeGo, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. 
uh, and a garbologist specializes in solid waste management. She's been active in this field since 1985 in Brazil, long one of the world's most progressive countries in integrating waste pickers into more formal solid waste management systems. And she's worked at a number of levels, municipal level, NGOs, and also for the World Bank's integrated solid waste and carbon finance projects. Third will be Rodolfo Lacy. He's now the director of the Environment Directorate at the OECD, organization that you presume, uh, I presume you know well, also one of the partners in the Green Growth Knowledge Platform. And before uh, joining OECD, Dr. Lacy had extensive experience in policy making in the field of environment, as he was a vice minister of environment policy and planning at the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of Mexico, and chief negotiator for Mexico. Uh, for the UNFCCC, COP19 to 23, and a number of other prestigious roles. The fourth and final speaker, because uh, the fifth, Anya Batia, unfortunately, is unable to join us today. So the fourth and final speaker, Christine Linz, works as executive director of w GWNet, the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition. And she has worked uh, for a long time on the subject of empowering women in the sustainable energy sector. Furthermore, she runs her own consultancy and is a member of the board of directors of ISES, the International Solar Energy Society. She has been the executive secretary of REN21, the Renewable Energy Policy Network for, of the 21st century, and also secretary general of the European Renewable Energy Council. So those are an interesting set of speakers. I think, as I've understood our instructions, all of our uh, speakers will turn on their camera one by one as they speak for their introduction, and then we'll stay on the line. I think we're all having everybody now also. Uh, they'll stay on the line as we have our discussion, so we can look at each other, and you can see our faces as we respond to each other as well. That's the idea. So with that, can I turn it over to Bridget for your first introductory statement? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and thank you to the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership for having this uh, webinar this morning and inviting me to join you. I feel very honored to be alongside the other panelists here, um, especially WeGo, who I've um, long admired as an organization and excited to hear from Sonia today. So um, as mentioned, my name is Bridget Burns. Um, I'm originally from the Bronx. I'm currently based in Brooklyn, which um, is uh, it's early morning here, and we are, of course, still shut down as, as many other places, um, but it has been, we've had some lovely weather, so it's making it feel like uh, things are not as bad as, as they might seem. Um, I'm the director of the Women's Environment and Development Organization, We Do, which is a 30-year-old global advocacy organization um, working at the intersections of gender and environmental justice. And um, many of you might know we do or have worked with we do over the last few uh, over the last few decades. Uh, particularly, we were founded around the time of the Earth Summit as really um, an entry point and a convening into the space of international global policy, where not only was the analysis that women's voices were not present, but that women's rights and gender equality issues were not being taken into account in the outcomes of those policy processes. So we do's vision is that a just world um, is working towards a just world that promotes human rights, gender equality, and environmental integrity. Uh, and if you will indulge me, because we are in moments where I think we should really change up the ways that we do things, I'm gonna just pull a little bit of poetry into our meeting this morning. One of my favorite poets, Aurora Levins Morales, who is a Puerto Rican Jewish poet. Um, and it's to live a lifetime of audacity, dwelling in the place where joy meets justice year after year can only be sustained by being so in love with a vision of what's possible that we no longer flirt with despair. And I, I share that because our vision for this just world at these intersections of human rights, gender equality, and environmental integrity um, have meant that as feminists and as activists that we've always worked at the intersections of multiple forms of crises. Um, whether that is been, has been engaging in multilateral environmental processes, 
whether it's been engaging in for the last decade now the climate change negotiations where really I think we see our job as not only documenting through very strategic advocacy what the gendered impacts of climate change are. So both the impacts that we are seeing in people's day-to-day -day lives, but also the impacts from climate change policies and sustainable development policies that are enacted or implemented in a gender-blind fashion and the way that they work um, to potentially exacerbate inequalities that exist. Um, it can be challenging and difficult to uh, tackle multiple forms of crisis at the same time. However, we know that by centering uh, an ethic of care and centering uh, leadership uh, and particularly the, the human rights of women and girls that we really have, it's the only way and the only opportunity that we have to actually create resilient societies. So currently in this moment we find ourselves in a crisis, a crisis among crises. Uh, you know it's a global plan pandemic that doesn't serve as the great equalizer as some have said but actually as a great exacerbator similarly to how climate change magnifies, amplifies, and compounds inequalities. And so we think this is a moment of that's challenging us to create urgent and systemic change, and that's showing the deep fault lines in how our societies are organized. Um, and I think it's a moment of reckoning and of reevaluation of whose labor is essential and of how to create resilient communities that are actually able to provide social protection and care. And similarly to how we do um, with its partners around the world approach any situation in building solidarity and collective and in working in collective as this pandemic became um, prevalent in the lives of so many of us, we really turned towards each other, gender activists, women's rights activists who had been working um, to engage in the Commission on the Status of Women, to engage in the UN climate negotiations, to en engage in the high level political forum on SDGs. And, you know, we came together to have a call and a reflection. And some of the things that we came up with in the short term of how do we think about this crisis? Firstly, was that it was a deeply personal and embodied crisis, one by being faced by each and every person in their own intersecting ways. And it's more, it's more evident now than ever that we should fully embrace and lift up feminist leadership in promoting self-care and being kind and compassionate to not only ourselves, but in reaching out um, with other activists and understanding how they're working through these crises. Um, that it's secondly a moment that demands the revaluing and centering of care. Um, and so the world is understanding what women's rights and feminist activists have been working on for decades, um, which is a full scale reevaluation of what work is essential. And with this comes an understanding of the gendered nature of this crisis and who is actually at the front lines. And even more so comes a concern about those whose work is already informal and precarious and who may not have access to social protection measures, even where measures are in place. We know that this crisis is deeply linked with migration and migrant justice, and that the impact of closing borders and implementing punitive and authoritarian measures in the short term will actually and could actually have long term um, implications and they need to be understood from the context of human rights. We know that their impact on the realization of sexual and reproductive health and rights could be devastating as we're already seeing um, these services being deemed as non-essential in the context already of a public health emergency. And finally, that the pandemic requires solutions that are framed in the context of global justice and equity, which is the context in which we as activists bring into our understanding of multilateralism in the first place. And so we came up with a set of principles, which I'll just share, and then I'll leave it over to my other panelists. Um, as a collective, we launched a website called Feminist COVID Response, um, where we have these principles listed. And we've also been tracking responses from countries uh, and communities that we either feel could um, be the start of very progressive change around issues like universal paid leave and healthcare, but also ones that we're very concerned about in terms of long-term measures. Um, and so our principles are that the responses must center the well-being of all people in an intersectional manner, that it must ensure the health and safety of all, including ensuring sexual and reproductive health and rights, 
um, that it must promote a paradigm shift uh, relying on adequate and equitable financing, so really shifting our economic systems currently. It must be based on and strengthen democratic values. They must promote a just and equitable transition for people and planet and really be a down payment on that just transition. And it must be guided by cooperation, multilateralism, and global justice. And we have some um, framing for what that should look like. Um, so I think that as an introduction to what I hope we can discuss today is really about how a lot of the knowledge lessons and solutions that women's rights activists and feminists have been speaking about for a very long time are, are really central to building a resilient and sustainable both response to COVID, but um, to our broader crises that we face collectively in terms of promoting sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. I think that's a very good way to kick this off. Maybe can we just hand it over to Sonia to have the next introduction? We'll have a chance to respond to your uh, opening statement and to maybe have some conversation among the panel as well, uh, following the other statements. Sonia, are you ready? Can we hand it over to you? I don't see Sonia coming up. There you are. Go ahead, Sonia. You may have to unmute yourself also. The little green, little microphone on the little technical panel there's the microphone and the camera and you have to click both of them yes i have a no, yeah. can you see me perfect we can, can see you and we can hear you now as well sorry perfect. i had a little bit of a technical problem here at my end so again good morning uh good afternoon or good evening wherever you are I'm really honored uh, to be here joining uh, such distinguished uh, guests. And I want to begin by explaining very briefly what a garpologist is. As a sociologist working into solid waste management uh, field, I began working in this field uh, in the mid 1980s. And it's a, as a field dominated by engineers, I needed to find a term to define the perspective that I was bringing in, uh, which at that time was quite unique to bring a social perspective to solid waste management. So it's why I am a garbologist. I like to call myself a garbologist. So I want to begin by quickly making the connection between informality and, and poverty and why we go. Uh, we know that most informal workers are poor, uh, most working poor are informally employed, where the earnings are low and the costs plus risk, risks are very high on average. And we know that women are concentrated in the lowest earning segments of informal employments in all regions. This is why we go women in informal employment globalizing and organizing exists. We are a global action and research policy uh, network that seeks to improve the status of the working poor, especially women in the informal economy through increased organization representation, improved statistics and research, more inclusive policy processes, more equitable trades and labor, and more equitable urban planning and social protection policies. And we work with four sector groups, street planners, waste pickers, domestic workers, and home-based workers. And one of the central tenets of WIGO's work is women empowerment. And from our perspective, uh, our perspective is informed by our close collaborations with the organizations of informal workers, unions, federations, national movements, and it's informed by its members who are mainly women in many uh, sector groups, and it's informed by our grounded knowledge on uh, informal workers and their livelihoods. 
and women workers are more likely than men uh, workers to be informally employed. And within the informal workforce, women face specific disadvantages and specific discrimination. And for us, for the WIGO network, empowerment uh, refers to the process of change that gives working poor women as individual workers and also as a members of workers' organizations, the ability to gain access to and exercise influence or control over the resources that they need for the work, over markets or value chains that they operate in, over the wider policy, regulatory and institutional environment that shapes their livelihoods and lives, and over the represented representative organizations that is within we we like to foster gender equality within the unions the cooperative movements that women belong to so strengthening women's leadership within their members organizations for us is key to a broader view of empowerment be it economic symbolic and political empowerment and we, we know that the coronavirus has spread quickest and deepest in the poor communities across the world. And recommended policies to fight the virus, lockdowns and stay at home restrictions have led to three economic crises in addition to the risk of infection and, and death. Uh, they are three interrelated crises, one right after the other no work, no income, and no food. So for the sector groups that WIGO works with, the waste pickers, street funders, domestic workers, and home-based workers, as well as many other groups of the working poor, the common plea is we will die of hunger before we die uh, from the virus. So we understand that you know, with the current focus on health responses and social distances, that we cannot separate the health risks from the economic risks that the working poor are facing. So practicing social distancing, and having responsible health practices is very difficult for informal workers, uh, especially for those who live in informal settlements. And globally, women empowerment employment is overwhelmingly informal and why forming a massive part of the informal economy women informal workers usually have a lower pay than men they are subject to higher his risks and they may have fewer resources at their disposal to face crisis and downturns so we need to overcome what has been deemed by some analysts as the tyranny of the urgence, which puts aside the structural issues to address immediate biomedical needs. And, and we need to factor gender right from the beginning of crisis and downturns. So from the perspective of the sector group that I work with, the informal way speakers, it is very important to set the ground about constraints that they face in the recycling sector, because women way speakers are usually not allowed access to recyclables within the highest value. They may not occupy positions of authority within their communities and also within uh, their um, membership based organizations. And of course, we have the, the asymmetrical power relations at the household, household level, affecting women's abilities to take part in public com, uh, committees or to exercise leadership within the representative organizations. And we have, you know, about the burden of child care. So during crisis and downturns, this pre-existing constraints are exacerbated. So that's why I think that this discussion today is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a very nice, bit more in-depth discussion of those specific issues that uh, women face. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
can we then move to Rudolfo for the third introduction? I see you. Can you? You also have to unmute. Now we hear you. Very good. Now I turn on my mic. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Frank, and thank you very much to the DGKP to invited us uh, to this uh, relevant panel. Uh, it is it is relevant the question, uh, of course, the topic, but it's also relevant uh, how we react uh, to this crisis with a gender perspective, and, and the OECD is is working on that, but from the uh, environment directorate uh, uh, perspective uh, is is uh, is a fundamental uh, to to work in the nexus between gender and environment of, in the uh, policy responses to the economic crisis uh, because uh, we are seeing a little bit of a backsliding in the policy responses from many governments especially when we talk of aligning the Paris Agreement uh, objectives with the uh, stimulus packages that they are, uh, of course, implemented uh, in a very hasty way. But let me uh, start saying that uh, we just recently uh, uh, organized a, a forum on gender mainstreaming and empowering women for environmental sustainability. And I will talk about some of the outcomes from this forum today and because the COVID-19 pandemic is not only a global public health crisis, it is uh, a tremendous social and economic uh, and environmental uh, problem. Uh, I will put some emphasis in, in the most challenging, uh, in my opinion, issue that we are facing in the gender and environment nexus agenda, that is uh, data. Uh, of course, if we cannot measure the problem, we cannot solve it, even if we cannot understand the problem. But uh, our recent economic estimates shows that the OECD countries' GDP declines by 2% for every month of lockdown. And many women are suffering of the lack of employment and suffering the consequences of this economic crisis. And, and this situation is uh, going to last a little bit more than we were expecting at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, some of the figures on unemployment are staggering. In the US, for instance, unemployment claims have gone up by over 30 million in a couple of months. How many of them are women? We don't know. What are the implications to their families, uh, to their uh, actual health conditions, environmental conditions, because many of the women are, of course, taking care of the environmental community health conditions and and that's that's an important question to answer uh, beyond the global health emergency and its economic and social ramifications uh, we should not forget uh, the environmental crisis that is waiting around the corner uh, we have to save the planet after this crisis so at the ecd we have reacted by establishing a digital half on the coronavirus which already contains over uh, 80 policy briefs. Uh, two of them are uh, from my uh, environment directorate. Uh, the name of those documents are Environmental Responses to COVID-19 and Environmental Health and Strengthening Resilience to Pandemics. That is focusing our policy recommendations in four different areas. Uh, Sonia and Bridget mentioned some of them, air, water, waste, biodiversity. I think that uh, we have to have in our countries specific measures to, to, or actions, uh, uh, policy recommendations um, to, to implement in, in, in this short term, but with a long-term vision. And of course, backing the, the objectives that we have in all the uh, environmental international regimes as the uh, climate convention, the biodiversity convention, the, the ocean, the new ocean agenda, and many other uh, conventions and instruments that we have, of course, to protect the planet and protect the health of the population. So uh, we are providing data analysis and policy advice on a wide range of areas in this uh, digital hub. 
I recommend you to, to visit the, the Hof. Uh, and of course, uh, we are putting a, a lot of emphasis mainstreaming the environmental uh, aspects. Uh, there is a, a specific uh, uh, brief on the impact of the crisis on women, which is a massive. Uh, workers in care homes for the elderly who have been worst hit by the virus are mainly women. Migrants accounting for a large share also nurses are mainly women. Women are mainly taxed uh, uh, with taking care of their children uh, who cannot go to the schools and also the, the, the sick parents at home. Uh, so women are taking care of them. Uh, when it comes to the gender uh, and environment nexus, we have a lot of anecdotes and, and plenty of case evidence, but scan systematic data collections that will allow organizations like the OECD uh, or many others, of course, uh, IMF, the World Bank, uh, to carry out serious comparative analysis. And the problem is, of course, even worse in developing countries. And we are helping with initiatives like Paris 21 to, of course, uh, reinforce their data collection. Uh, to give you just an idea of the big challenge that we are facing, we did the five uh, planet goals of the uh, Agenda 2030, uh, that is that are those specifically on the environment, climate, oceans, biodiversity. There are only four explicitly defined gender-related environmental indicators. Uh, and this is, this is uh, quite relevant. Uh, now that we are facing the crisis, if we don't have enough information, it is hard, as I was explaining, to solve the problem that uh, is in front of us. Uh, uh, when, when we started to hear that air pollution is related uh, with the pandemic because air pollution is exacerbating the health effects of, of, uh, of the population. And particles specifically are like uh, rocks in the rivers that can, of course, be used to cross from one place to another, no? from, from one uh, side of the river to the other side. Uh, the COVID can be transmitted uh, through uh, uh, particles. Uh, by the way, I had a lot of experience in, in air quality monitoring systems and we uh, had been working a lot in many countries to identify those particles that are viable to carry uh, uh, pathogens or, or, uh, or biological uh, uh, the sea salt is, is, is something that we have to, to, to measure. So the OECD identified last year three new gender disaggregated indicators. Of course, one is the exposure to environmental risks differentiated by risk type, like air pollutant or extreme weather events by sex, age, and socio-demographic attributes. Mortality rates from air pollution differentiated by pollutant, sex, age, country, and year and development of green technologies based on patenting activity differentiated by domain, country, year, and sex uh, of the inventor. And more of these indicators um, are available in the brochure that was launched during the uh, form that I was uh, telling you. The name of the brochure is Gender and Environmental Statistics. We normally flag our pop, uh, publications, but uh, I, I will do it, of course, with my iPad. <laughs> Let me show you the, the, the cover of the, of the document, but we have different chapters, the gender differences in attitudes and behaviors, the social demographic differences in exposure to air pollution, the gender differences in health outcomes from exposure to environmental related risks. So uh, we are also in this document uh, drawing uh, or depicting uh, 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 roadmap, what are the next steps when we talk about this environment nexus data um, challenge. So uh, the OECD countries uh, are contributing to this, of course, information, but there is a massive uh, data gap in this area. Uh, we made a survey very recently and only nine countries from the 37 countries that are part of the OECD uh, are regularly uh, 
providing information about gender. So uh, that is, in my opinion, one of the things that uh, the OECD is contributing to the global discussion on, on this topic. Well, thank you very much again for your patience. Thank you, Rodolfo. Diving into some of the specific things OECD is doing, and we are seeing questions in the chat, and some of the previous presenters are already starting to answer their questions. Uh, to you, Rodolfo, there was a question on can you provide the links to the data hubs? Maybe you can type those into the chat. Uh, and indeed, we're also catching a few, a few questions mm -hmm. from the audience to the panelists that we'll try to come back to after Christine's introduction. So thank you, Rodolfo. And I think we go to the final introduction from Christine, and then we'll respond to each other and have a number of questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and thanks for the invitation to be on board of today's webinar. I am going to add, I guess, uh, to um, the different perspectives that we have heard, uh, a bit of an energy uh, angle. Uh, and we see that the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic has significant impacts on the global energy situation. Uh, we argue that, of course, there are new opportunities arising to promote sustainable energy, uh, energy efficiency and uh, renewables. Uh, we clearly see that men and women are impacted differently uh, by the crisis. And uh, therefore, it's important that in all efforts uh, to build back better, women need to be fully included. How is uh, this reflected? We see in general uh, a strengthening of the agency of governments. Um, they impose lockdowns uh, and adopt emergency programs. Borders are closed. And, uh, and, and we see this reflex of retreating to the perceived uh, safety of the homeland that might continue even after uh, the virus has been tamed. And so I guess uh, in the energy field, this will mean uh, that there will be uh, a reinforced impetus to strengthen energy security. And that can, of course, be done through renewables and uh, energy efficiency. We also see that uh, renewables being available in all countries uh, around the world uh, and their level of development uh, within the different territories being uh, very different. Um, there is the potential to uh, increase uh, in these technologies. They are decentrally available, so they create jobs, uh, which I think is something uh, that will be uh, most relevant uh, in the years to come. And uh, we can also uh, imagine that the decoupling uh, to um, uh, very volatile uh, fossil fuel markets uh, will help countries uh, to uh, save money and, and also uh, stabilize their uh, energy bills. And uh, we also see, of course, that uh, COVID pushes uh, electricity as a means of communication uh, significantly and it pushes electronic means uh, of communication significantly, which means that uh, electricity demand is uh, increasing. And uh, it's clear that uh, we would not be able to do this webinar in our home office uh, without power and uh, ICT technologies. So it is important. Uh, we also see that uh, women uh, are still underrepresented uh, also in the energy sector. And that uh, has led to the creation of the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition uh, this organization is a non-profit organization um, that was created in 2017, so we are fairly young uh, compared to uh, the other players here on this panel uh, with the aim to advance the global energy transition by empowering women in energy through interdisciplinary networking, advocacy, training, uh, coaching and uh, mentoring. I am uh, proud to say that in these three years of our existence, uh, we uh, have been able to um, have more than 1,000 members from uh, over uh, 90 countries around the world. So it's a truly global network of both individuals and organizations uh, working at this intersection between energy and gender. We uh, organize different networking events, work on advocacy, participate in studies, publish our own studies, and uh, also uh, offer mentoring programs uh, throughout uh, the world, focused on different technologies, be it wind or energy storage, 
uh, but also focused on different uh, geographical jurisdictions uh, such as the MENA region, Latin America at the moment, and uh, some um, programs on energy access uh, for the African continent. Clearly, uh, we see that uh, the situation in the, in the energy field is still uh, far away from being gender balanced. According to statistics from IRENA, International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, one of our strategic partners, there are currently about 11 million people working in the renewables field. And this number is supposed to go up to 42 million uh, in the year 2050. And out of these 11 million, there are currently about 32% uh, of uh, women in the renewables uh, workforce, which is higher than in the field of uh, oil and gas, where it's just 22% of women. But still we see, um, when we look at um, the level of qualification, that the higher we move up on the career ladder, uh, the, the lower the share of women uh, is, and of course, when it comes to, to STEM jobs, uh, stops in science, technology, um, there are uh, even less women. So, um, and if we want to uh, be able to make this move from 11 million to 42 million uh, in these uh, 30 years ahead of us, it's clear that we need to harvest the best talents uh, in the space and we need the best uh, talents from both uh, men and uh, women. And we see, uh, and we've just uh, published a study earlier this year on um, how women in sustainable energy, how to foster women's talents. We see that there lies a big power in gender equality. Uh, when more women join the workforce, everyone benefits. Uh, not only is it the human right that women participate uh, and have equal access to employment, um, but also we see, and there are different studies uh, showing that uh, global GDP uh, will be significantly or could significantly uh, be increased uh, between, and the studies say, between 10, 12 uh, to 28 trillion US dollars per year if gender equality uh, would be reached. Uh, it's clear that companies with diverse leadership have better results. There is scientific evidence for this, which we also detail uh, in this study. Um, they are better prepared uh, to, for, to survive financial shock. Uh, they um, are better uh, ready for innovation and also uh, for increased action in environmental uh, areas. Uh, and they often have more stringent decarbonization policies. And, uh, and this is all in all what is needed. And when we uh, think about the energy transition that we had, have ahead of us, which for example, the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies uh, describes as a multidimensional, complex, non-linear, non-deterministic process, it is clear that um, this energy transition will radically reform the way energy is produced and consumed. It goes beyond just replacing fossil with clean sources. It changes consumption patterns, distribution and investment, uh, it changes uh, coalitions and capabilities of actors, and uh, it also changes mindsets, beliefs and social practices. So what we will require is behavioral change, and uh, we will for this need diverse backgrounds and capabilities and perspectives, and we need a large and diverse uh, pool of talent. And that's exactly uh, where we come in, where we think that uh, by having women participate uh, at equal um, footing with men will not only make this process uh, quicker, but it will also make it socially uh, more just. And, uh, and that's exactly what we work on. And yes, um, of course, the situation at the moment is alarming. And uh, I share uh, the, um, uh, what has been said by, by previous panelists, uh, by Sonia, that of course the poor are, poorest of the poor are the most uh, affected in, in this crisis, but I also see the potential of um, adding sustainability and uh, a more uh, gender um, balanced uh, uh, decision making in this uh, recovery after COVID-19 and uh, yeah, stop here and uh, I'm, I'm happy to provide further insights into the discussion. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, so now I think, uh, can I ask all the panelists to turn on their cameras so we can 
sort of join each other in a discussion. We had prepared uh, a number of questions in advance, but uh, we've also been watching the chat uh, and we've seen a number of additional good questions come in. So maybe we can combine the first question we had prepared, which was a fairly general one on how are women affected by uh, downturns and crises like this one? With the more pointed question from Angela Evelika, for instance, it says in developing countries, how women can face the lockdown when the basic need is food. Relating to the SDGs, they're struggling between dying by the virus and dying because of hunger. So how to overcome this? That, of course, puts that uh, question of how women are affected by this crisis uh, in a very pointed manner. So can we maybe have the different panelists would like to respond to this uh, respond to this first question. I don't know whether uh, Bridget, would you like to start with a general perspective on how women are affected by this, and then sure, maybe yeah, happy to. And I think I think a lot of this has been or was articulated, and and Sonia articulated a lot of this as well in terms of, um, you know, we see and as, as stated in ours that the further marginalization in an economic system that is basically set up in a way that informalizes and makes precarious a lot of care work which is often carried out by women and it, you know this is a crisis which is i think a lot of feminist epistemology and analysis has always been that what gets gets discounted in our societies uh, and in and even measures of growth is what's within the household. It's what's considered the personal. And this is a crisis that has been shifting our framing of what is the private versus the public. And in that space, there's a lot of gendered impacts of what people are facing. And in the form of work, because we know that labor is an area at which the gendered impacts are so, so clear, we're seeing um, that that work that is most often informal and, and and people who've been deemed, whether these are people who we're talking about communities that are deemed um, stateless, you know, beyond just the informal precarity of work, we have people who are deemed stateless by foreign policy. We have uh, indigenous peoples whose sovereignty is not being recognized um, and who don't fit necessarily even into the responses that are being developed. And so it's, a constant discussion of how do you make sure that the the both the responses that are being developed are not uh, are taking into account the multiple intersecting crises that people face and the impacts and how they're feeling these impacts. I think we see um, we see obviously the front lines of care work um, is our majority women. Uh, I think over 70% of women in the United States of those who are nurses and teachers um, are are women, and so there. This work is clearly work that's not only it's being shown to be the work that we rely on, um, but it has not received the value in our societies, um, whether it's prior to this or in the form of protective equipment uh, and support that that is needed now to be able to combat the crisis. We're seeing even examples of, um, you know, in that sort of the public, the private space becoming the public space, how this um, in different communities, this reassessment of gender roles within households is coming to the forefront where um, we've recently uh, had lots of different articles about how um, women researchers are, are publishing less than men now because they are taking on a lion's share of work in the household, which has, of course, long term impacts. Um, we've also seen examples of uh, where women have kind of taken a step back in economic spaces that they were working in before to take on that caregiving role, even in households with several partners um, uh, and with other family members where that burden could be taken up. Um, and I, of course, I think the most the most immediate impacts that are very visible is increase in gender-based violence. So I, the UNFPA um, had just came up or said the statistic that I think it's 30 million um, are going to be at, at every six months, the baseline of women being impacted by gender-based violence in their households are increasing by 30 million uh, due to the pandemic. And that that there every six months there's an estimate of seven million unintended uh, pregnancies that will be happening as a result of lack of access to sexual and reproductive health and rights 
services, um, and then that over around 47 million will lose access to contraception. So there's a whole array of impacts from public health impacts outside of the immediate impacts of the response that absolutely need to be taken into consideration as we craft what these responses look like. And they all come back to the same issue of not centering social protection, public health, and an understanding of informality of who, when we talk about rights, even just relying on the idea of a human rights framework, who has, who's deemed, um, as someone who has those rights in a society because it's not the same and it's not universal and each community and who has access to social protection and rights is something that needs to be considered as we develop policies but i'm sure sonia can speak to the informality piece a lot more well thank you that was a very solid response uh, sonia did you want to add to that or shall we move to another question what would you like uh, yes Please, you know, I think Bridget, uh, you know, uh, answer was really spot on. I think yeah. with the focus on social uh, protection. Uh, I think what I wanted to bring is it's like a very short story of, on how this plays out, you know, lack of social protection and all the burden uh, that women face in terms of caregiving and also the fact that they are the main breadwinners in many uh, families. Uh, I'm going to take you very quickly through the situation of someone I know, a way speaker, whose name, Maria, is not her real name, but her story is real, and she can no longer work in the city is open down, but she lives in uh, in the country, uh, and she cannot work because uh, she can no, no longer enter the disposal site where she pick up recyclables. And what she managed to collect, you know, the little that she managed to collect in the in the street bins of her city, she cannot sell it because many junk shops are now closed due to due to the outbreak. So she has no access to the basic cash grant because she could not manage to fill in the digital form for the national cash grant scheme that was uh, issued by the federal government of Brazil. So she's unable to feed her family of four, which includes her unemployed husband. And we all know that uh, COVID-19 effects uh, has also expanded the physical, the social, and the political spaces of uh, gender-based violence. And many, many women are trapped with abusive partners because of the quarantine measures. And this is the case of Maria, who suffers domestic abuse. You know, in one of the episodes of domestic violence in the past, she had lost one of her fingers. So I think this kind of illustrates, you know, uh, how COVID-19 is not gender neutral, neutral. And it really raises the importance of applying an intersectional lenses to the crisis and recognizing that there are multiple social and identity factors that includes class, race, sexuality, the occupation the person has, which shapes people's individual uh, vulnerability to disease outbreaks. And also it shapes their capacity to cope and to develop response. So yeah, social protection is crucial at this time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think that illustrates the differences uh, rather starkly. Now, in the follow-up question, because of course, all of us see that huge amounts of money are going to be spent to try and recover from COVID and a key focus will be on recovering from unemployment. And Rodolfo gave quite a few of the numbers already around unemployment. Uh, so it would be interesting to see whether, uh, if there are any data that Rodolfo has whether all these stimulus packages that have already been uh, approved, whether they have had a positive impact, including a more gendered perspective there. And then we had a question from Sarah Hastings Simon that says, you know, what is the relative importance or likelihood of success of pursuing the growth of women in traditionally male-dominated industries like construction of things like renewable energy that 
Christine brought up. Uh, and, you know, as uh, we are all arguing that uh, COVID-19 recovering should be more sustainable, does that bring the risk that more traditional industries like infrastructure for renewable energy will be supported and not those areas where caregiving or where women are more dominant? So that I think is a, a critical question on, are we able to address the, the gendered issues that you have just brought out through these COVID recovery packages? Rodolfo, could you say something about the, the data that we already have and then maybe the other panelists as well on this, this particular issue? You have to unmute first, Rodolfo. Let me try to, yeah, now yeah. I unmute. Yes, uh, at the OECD, of course, we are tracking all the uh, stimulus packages that uh, the countries are implementing right now. As I was explaining, many of them uh, are having just a short-term uh, goal. And uh, it is our, in our recommendation to uh, keep the long-term uh, targets that we have in our countries on the environmental domain. Uh, so uh, we are, of course, uh, recommended uh, to uh, evaluate each of the policy responses uh, in environmental terms. That's the first recommendation. Second, we, we have to uh, avoid a rollback of the environmental policies, especially those that are related, for example, with the gender aspects, but mainly related with the world in general of the population because many of the things that are happening right now is to are related, of course, with the employment, uh, many of them with, with health, because that's the, the, the core of the crisis. But uh, when we talk about the economic consequences of, of that pandemic, of the pandemic, uh, uh, we are seeing some specific sectors that are affected. For example, the oil and gas industry. We mentioned that uh, there are some industries that uh, are now uh, trying to be rescued from the governments and when the oil prices fall down, what was the uh, response from the governments, especially in the G20? Well, a massive uh, support to those specific industries to keep the oil price higher and the production and the distribution of many of the products and the products of this industry. Of course, it is good for the economy, but it is not as good for the environment as we were expecting. Why? Uh, let, me, let me give you, uh, in my opinion, one of the uh, key elements that uh, we are promoting. We, we have to return to a new normality to, to build back uh, better. And thinking in the sustainable uh, economy of the future. Instead, of course, of supporting polluting industries, we have to support those industries that are able, of course, uh, to, to be more uh, uh, friendly to the environment, for sure, low carbon and resilient. That's, or those are the attributes that we are looking to in the uh, stimulus packages. A green recovery program that is part of the phase three uh, is, is, is of course the, 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 the final solution when we talk about how to reestablish the normality that we were used to uh, live uh, before the, the crisis. But this is, this is something hard for the governments because uh, uh, they are, they, they, they have to speed up many of the, of the investments that were delayed because there was no enough money, there was no enough uh, consensus around them. But this is the time, the, the crisis is the time to take hard decisions in the government to support those activities that can give us a, a, a better quality of life, a better quality of the environment, and also to protect those that are more vulnerable. Women are more, is, 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 is a group of, of, of people that is more vulnerable to environmental pollution problems, but also to these kind of new pandemics. Uh, I, I, I was 
thinking the other day that the pandemics are like extreme weather events to climate, but pandemics related to the biodiversity uh, issue. Why? Because the, the biodiversity loss is uh, increasing the sonosis uh, 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 cases and also increasing the the the, the extreme uh, biodiversity crisis that we will uh, read or saw for the first time in the IPCC reports uh, one or two decades ago. So it, it is clear that this problem, this pandemic, is related with the biodiversity loss, and the biodiversity loss is related with climate change. So. Uh, those are uh, our main recommendations and, and, and the, the other uh, recommendations that we are, of course, doing is to uh, do everything in a transparent way, put in clear indicators, clear metrics to measure the real impact on jobs, wealth and, of course, healthy conditions to the population, because we are not doing that in our governments and that's a necessity. Thank you. Thank you, Rodolfo. You, you talk about almost first principles. Yes, we hope that these large flows of money don't simply flow back to rescuing oil and gas, but that they will be used to accelerate a green transition. But if that is the case, does that then automatically mean that we can also address gender inequities? I mean, Christine, you already addressed this a little bit, that the number of women or the share of women in renewables is a bit higher, 32%, I think you said, rather than in oil and gas where it's 22. But that's still potentially exacerbating inequities rather than addressing them and certainly not addressing them radically. So are there opportunities to use COVID recovery funding more radically to support uh, or address uh, gender inequities when you're ready, Christine. Yes, uh, I will give it a try. You might have already seen that I get some assistance here. Uh, it's also in, in times of COVID-19, childcare facilities are not very, uh, it's not so easy to get at the moment. So I'm handling my six month old daughter uh, while participating in this webinar. I do apologize in case there is some uh, interference. No uh, need to yes. apologize. <laughs> we understand. I think uh, you're courageous. Yeah. And demonstrate um, the importance of care. Exactly. Uh, and she seems to enjoy it. At least she's looking uh, vividly into the computer and watching all these faces. Uh, no, I fully agree with what Rodolfo has said. Uh, I think it is important to uh, privilege uh, investments in, in, in sustainable investments right now. Uh, and of course, um, investments in infrastructure, for example, will create jobs uh, in, in the remote areas. Uh, investments in public transport uh, will, um, will help also the, the, the poorer parts uh, of the population. And, uh, and of course, uh, for example, we have at the moment, I'm based here in Austria, we have a big discussion about uh, recover, uh, saving the government, uh, saving and putting a lot of money into our national airline. Uh, and I think this is happening at the moment in many other parts in the world. Uh, of course, it's important for a country to have an airline, but uh, we, we see in the discussion, at least here, uh, that this is also the chance to address these sustainability issues uh, when these recovery packages are, uh, are being made. Uh, we are talking here about um, cutting off short uh, distance flights, uh, replacing them by, by direct rail connections uh, with major other European cities, etc., etc. So there are means, I think, to really uh, actively addressing sustainability issues uh, also when it comes to more traditional companies. They can also, I mean, we also have to be clear, um, Energy transition means a transition away from fossil fuels towards uh, renewables, but that doesn't mean that the fossil fuels will go away from one day to the other. So uh, it is important to make also the uh, conventional uh, sector more sustainable, and there are lots of means uh, to be able to do this. It's clear that this does uh, not automatically uh, address gender issues. That's why we argue that it is very important that in, uh, in boards, uh, 
in, 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 in policies that are being made, women are um, uh, systematically uh, added as decision makers because very often we get decisions that impact women, especially when it comes to, for example, clean cooking uh, in, uh, in developing countries. And, and the decisions are made by men who have often no clue, uh, sorry to say that uh, bluntly like this, about uh, the situation at home. And so it's important that when decisions are being taken, when policies are made, uh, that, that women's views are included. And we just see that one way of doing this is um, the setting of uh, targets and quotas. Uh, because by just letting uh, the economy take up women's uh, perspectives uh, as we go along. We will need another uh, another decade or more, and I think uh, we don't really have this time. So um, the the time of crisis will not answer all the gender questions, but we need to really uh, start including women uh, in in every uh, part of the uh, of the decision decision spectrum. Thank you. So could we turn maybe to not only coming from the traditional and going towards sustainability, but addressing the issues of gender inequities and women's empowerment a bit more head on? What should we do if we want to prioritize uh, the gender inequities and women's empowerment and maybe through that angle uh, address sustainability as well? So can we come from the other end? and? Bridget or Sonia, are you interested in picking that up? Bridget, I think I see you not there, and Sonia as well. <clears throat> yeah, um, I wanted to to blend from the previous into this question. I think um, the something that Sonia said, she brought up the tyranny of the urgent, and that is uh, it remains a key challenge that we have even in these moments because realistically we have to also understand that for those who are disinterested in radical policy shifts it's you know they use and wield the tyranny of the urgent to kind of push out any conversation around building back better or including anything any suggestion beyond an immediate urgent public health um, response is somehow bringing forward a political agenda to what is a public health crisis. And I think the tyranny of the urgent is something that continually stops us from creating systemic radical shifts by those who willed it to kind of keep the systemic issues um, out of it. And, and that cuts across everything that I think many of us have worked on, even as we've seen, for example, I would say over the last decade, a much deeper and intentional conversation around the intersections of social justice and gender justice, gender justice within environment and climate. There's still not, you know, a day that goes by where we don't talk about gender equality in the context of, con of climate and environment and get some eye rolls or some suggestions that we are overburdening an already complex issue. And so this real kind of push away from the systemic is something we need to be very strategic in our advocacy and our work and our policy creation about how we deal with that. And I do think that this goes to what Christine was saying, is that a lot of this fundamentally starts with shifting how we, uh, who participates in decision making. Um, and I think kind of the most, one of the most and first important things that we need to do as leaders and as advocates and policymakers is to unapologetically and boldly resist the tyranny of the urgent by creating systems of reflection and response that are inclusive. And so I've been surprised to see in, you know, even in my own state here in the United States where, um, you know, a committee to think about the future of education was put together that included one educator and that educator was at a university level. It did not include educators across the spectrum. It didn't include parents. It didn't include parents in different economic communities. It didn't include children, for example. Um, and we constantly repeat this failure to put the people who are at the front lines of the policies that we're crafting, who are going to be most impacted in the decision making space and in the in at around the table to think, OK, how can we craft an inclusive policy that really will leave no one behind? Because when we don't include those voices, we inevitably create policies 
and solutions that aren't inclusive and don't center care. And so I think that the, one of the first steps in these COVID responses, at whether it's at city level, community level, or state level, is making sure that those you have in the room who are trying to develop the policies are actually reflective of the communities and the neighborhoods that you're crafting them for. And that happens at a community level, and it's why we work, for example, to make sure that in the UN climate change negotiations, where 20 percent of those who are heads of delegation are women, that we actually address the fact that we can't solve the climate crisis if you know if half the world's population is not included in the discussions about how we develop those policies so i think inclusive leadership is one i have also been really inspired and i think we should be really elevating this conversation by the leadership we're seeing for example from the health minister in kerala who is a former secondary education teacher kerala has been doing really amazing responses to the COVID crisis but that's centered on investments in public education and so we need to be uplifting the stories of women's leadership feminist leadership that is centering an ethic of care that is using the um the values of inclusive leadership, the values of investments in public education, and thinking about how do you develop policies that's reaching out to all aspects and all spectrums of the communities, um, and thinking and thinking about policies in a new ways, not relying on the systems that are currently set up, which we know are leaving certain people behind. Um, and I think that you know, for us, that there's more than enough evidence out there on why investments in women and girls' healthcare and education are actually central to creating resilient societies, resilient to climate impacts, and being able to promote sustainable development. Thank you, Bridget. Rodolfo, you were waving your hand. Did you want to come in quickly? Did you respond? want to respond to Bridget? Uh, well, uh, I would like to make a, a general comment on the effect during the uh, pandemic uh, on women. Why? Because uh, uh, well, evidence shows that men uh, seems more at risk of a fatal outcome when infected. Women are the major employers uh, in, in the sectors that are affected. For example, uh, in the health system, women make up almost 70% of the healthcare workforce. If you don't have a good waste management, hazardous waste, biological infection waste uh, uh, management, uh, you will have a problem. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, if I remember well, Sonia mentioned that uh, when women get the job, the co-benefits in the society uh, are, are huge. But when they lost the job, when they get sick, the damage to the society is also huge. So this is a very important linkage between of course, waste management systems. I, I'm, I, by the way, I'm, I'm seeing every night here in my in my street people gathering informal employers of the waste management system and uh, trying to get some uh, uh, object value objects uh, in, in, uh, uh, during the night without any protection. No one is, of course, testing them. So uh, in the waste management system in developed countries, but it's worse in developing countries, the, we have a huge problem. And many of the workers in poor areas are moving every night to of course these kind of good neighborhoods in, in our cities to collect garbage from the e-commerce that is of course in, in, in one of the solutions to the, to the environment, the development solutions to the crisis. Uh, uh, this uh, waste uh, packaging uh, uh, things that, that are in the streets can be contaminated with the virus. So they are spreading the virus uh, with these informal activities and we are not protecting them. And we have to protect them and we have to protect the, the healthcare workforce, of course, women, uh, and we have also to see that those women need to commute and they commute sometimes in, in very bad conditions. So we, we have to have cleaner, of course, uh, buses, safe uh, transportation modes, uh, healthy conditions at hospitals, in clinics, 
Uh, all this is related with environmental policies. It's not only related with the traditional social policies. We have to have on place good basic environmental infrastructure. And because of the lack of that, the pandemic is worse in many of our cities, in the most populated ones, and also in many of developing uh, countries. Thank you, Rodolfo. We'll go back to Sonia. Yes, we'll go back to you, Sonia. And I'm also keeping an eye on the time. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think if all of you will prepare uh, a little bit your final thoughts of your key points you'd leave, you want to leave the audience with, then maybe we'll turn to you, Sonia, and then try to give all the other panelists uh, a chance for some final reflections on the most important Sonia. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my job was made easier by the previous speakers, Bridget, yes. <laughs> and also uh, thank you for raising uh, solid waste management. And uh, I think this is, and you really touched um, upon something very important, which is uh, the issue of essential workers. And we we know how important uh, solid waste management, you know, solid waste collection is. And this whole coronavirus crisis has reshuffled the hierarchy of uh, labor value. And we see some low wage uh, precarious workers, uh, including informal and formal waste collectors, you know, and amongst other uh, workers such as, uh, you know, home care, health, AIDS, and et cetera. They have been deemed essential uh, to the functional functioning of the economy, but they, although they are showered with praise, they do, do not get the hazard pay and they do not get enough protection that they deserve to perform this essential work. And uh, when we look at the work of women, you know, I get so many reports over the day with, from the workers that I work with, mainly women, because in the cooperative movement of Brazil, over 50% of the cooperative members are women. And I get videos and I get audios uh, from these women leaders uh, talking about the need to have access to protective, personal protective equipment, but also about something that Christine touched upon, upon which is infrastructure because we know that we if we focus only on ppe personal protective equipment we are putting the burden on the workers because infrastructure it's really important for uh, minimization of risks so investment on infrastructure is very important and investment in infrastructure that's it, that is gender sensitive you know we know that some of the cooperatives that uh, women work with, they barely have a toilet. Uh, so I think as a final kind of thought, we really need to think about integrating women's empowerment and gender equality and in ways that can build the capacity uh, of women with the necessary skills that they need to perform as uh, service providers for government solid waste systems, as uh, also contributors to the value chain and as leaders in the social movements. Because if we don't build capacity and if we don't factor in uh, the right infrastructure that is needed, and if we don't factor protection and also fair payments for workers in the informal economy and within the informal economy for women because they get higher, a lower pay than men in the informal economy. So if we don't factor protection and fair payment, sustainability and resilience, it's, uh, it's kind of a fiction actually. So we do need to think of resilience as something that help us to bounce forward instead of bouncing backwards, because we do need transformative uh, changes, uh, especially in our society, 
as a whole. And within the sector that I work with, uh, solid waste uh, uh, management, we do need transformative change. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Christine, can I turn to you next? I think you work in another sector where transformative change would be very welcome and where, in fact, we may be seeing some signs of that as a result of COVID. Exactly. I, I think it's, it, it's clear that uh, the, the crisis is having an, a terrible effect on, on many people uh, all around the world. We also see that there is a, a chance to, to make our system more sustainable, to, to rethink uh, consumption patterns and, uh, and to really uh, build that resilience that, uh, that we lack into, into our new way of, uh, of existing. We, our way forward uh, in order to um, advance the role of women in the energy field is clearly uh, to strengthening, strengthening them. That's why we have set up these various mentorship programs because we see that uh, there is, uh, having a, a female role model in the field is something very powerful. And uh, the whole motivation for creating TWNet was actually that I was giving lots of talks and lectures at conferences. And often women came afterwards towards me and uh, they were inspired and they said, well, it's, it's, it's so refreshing to, to get the opinion of women because mostly the panels are, uh, are, um, are, 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 are full of men. And, yes. uh, and and so one of the things we are doing are these mentoring programs. We have also created uh, what we call the Women in Energy Expert Platform, where women can showcase their expertise. Uh, they can register free of charge. So should you be here on the webinar, women working in this field, uh, go and check out uh, GWNet's website, globalwomennet.org, uh, and register, create your profile, uh, show your uh, competence and experience because we just want to go out there and, and showcase all these capable women and put them in networks and, uh, and, uh, and support them and empower them. And I also uh, come back to a point that uh, Rudolfo has mentioned earlier, we need more gender desegregated data. And uh, in the energy field also, uh, there are not uh, specific data available about uh, in, in, uh, the, the role of men and women. That's why we have created this report together with ARENA on renewable energy agenda perspective, which details, uh, which cites these 32% uh, of share of women in the workforce. Uh, this is just a starting point. Much more is needed. Uh, but uh, when there is no data, it is very difficult uh, to have political action. And so uh, we need to also make our politicians accountable by making sure that uh, we can quantify uh, the, the action and then also measure the impact. Thank you, Christine. We'll go to Bridget and then back to Rodolfo for final words. Bridget? Yes, thanks so much. Um, I think that the, you know, a takeaway from this is, and, and the work that we've been doing for many years now is actually just trying to push, pushing for transformation and understanding that transformation requires radical rethinking and really, really, truly radical rethinking. Um, because I think that so far we've always kind of done this work and sort of tweaking around the margins of, of uh, you know, creating small change in particular industries and hoping this will lead to systemic transformation. And I remember watching the, not physically, but watching online as uh, here in New York when things became very, very escalated in, in the crisis that we're facing with the pandemic and watching what is what is a, a warship that had been turned into a hospital ship. Um, and so it was a, a, an army ship that serves, um, or a Navy ship that serves the US um, Army. And just thinking, you know, and again, this goes back to, to things and tenants that, that have been a long part of feminist analysis of what does it mean to center an ethic of care in our public and private spaces? and what does it mean to be calling for a world that's centered around peace and social justice as opposed to the systems that we have now? And what if we could learn from this crisis and see something like the infrastructure of a giant warship being used for public health? What if we actually took the $1.7 trillion we spend in global military budgets each year and reoriented that towards investment in social protection? What if we really challenge the bailouts that are going to uphold the oil and gas industries, which we know are causing our climate crisis, and really took strong leadership 
about reorienting that towards support for our frontline workers, not just in the immediate short term, but as Sonia was saying, to revalue what those jobs are, to use and say, we, you know, we have long overdue um, unrecognized value in our essential workers, whether they are waste pickers or, you know, those who take care of our children. And we want a full scale reevaluation of what that looks like, which is not necessarily meaning that we're pushing women into just one industry, into male dominated infrastructure industries. Across the board, we're trying to break down the sexual division of labor and having spaces that are dominated by women, care industries, revalued as spaces where all people would like to be working um, because we're part of a community, a global community around social protection. And it's even difficult sometimes in articulating that because it can come off as quite ideological and idealistic and radical. And that's a problem. That should not be a radical idea. And so I think that and I hope that these conversations um, around the COVID crisis, that we are unapologetically radical in our ideas, how we use this moment for transformation, because I, I genuinely think that's the only way we'll learn from it. Thank you, Richard. Well, Rodolfo, if we are going to see radical change, can we measure progress? And of course, Christine already mentioned the importance of gender data. You might explain why gender data is important and whether you and OECD are tracking things in a gendered manner so that we can measure progress. Well, uh, it is true that uh, there is a lack of uh, information in our systems, in the information systems we have. So we are working with our countries to gather more information. Uh, as, as I was saying, uh, this, uh, oh, this document is the first of its kind. And you, you can, of course, uh, download the document for free. <laughs> it's important to say. Um, and uh, we are, uh, and we have to remember this, we are emphasizing the alignment of the short-term emergency responses to the achievement of long-term economic, social, and environmental objectives and international obligations. We have action plans on gender for the UNFCCC and also for the CBD. Those documents are the roadmap for the next uh, uh, five years at least. So that, that's very important. The, the other thing that uh, governments may wish to do is to systematically evaluate possible unintended negative environmental and gender impacts of stimulus measures. Uh, they, they have to integrate a gender and environmental impact assessment. Uh, this is quite relevant and, and, and I think that uh, we are able to do it. Uh, in addition, green and gender budgeting can help ensure that both green and gender perspective are applied to measures, including the fiscal stimulus package. Government should also reframe some rolling back existing environmental or labor standards as part of the recovery plans. That, that's also very important. Uh, so um, I would like to say also that in our database, we are seeing that many of the SD indicators are not uh, measured by gender. And it's, it's, it's important to do an extra effort to expand the scope of those indicators that can be related or are related with gender, and we are not measuring that. So we need to uh, uh, expand the metrics of the SDGs. Uh, yes, the SDGs are good, uh, are very uh, challenging, but if we don't make, if we don't measure the gender dimension, we are losing the objective of, of our uh, environmental integrity policies. Thank you. And thank you to all four uh, of our panelists. I think we had not enough time, of course, but an interesting discussion. I think there's no doubt that uh, there is a gender difference in how we experience uh, the COVID crisis. There are definitely opportunities to address that in a way that reduces gender inequities and helps with this agenda of, of women empowerment. It won't be easy. I think we've set out a number of the barriers as well. We've seen uh, quite a few people participate in the chat online. I've tried to bring in a number of the questions that you have brought forward. Uh, some of our panelists have also provided some responses through the chat. 
So I hope that uh, all of you online and our panelists found this uh, a useful discussion of obviously a super important subject. Uh, and I uh, am glad that we had a chance to put the spotlight on this particular issue of uh, women in, well, gender inequities and the importance of women empowerment as we address COVID uh, recovery in a hopefully both sustainable and gendered way. So can I thank all of you? Uh, and with this, uh, close the webinar. I thank the panel as well as all of you uh, participating online. No, Have thank a great you very much. Day. Have a good evening. Stay safe. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.